Welcome back, Cornerstone Kids. It's good to see you guys again. It's been a very exciting week for our church. There's been all sorts of exciting things changing about when people can get back together. So I'm sure your families are already talking about it. And it is so fun to see that soon, and hopefully very soon, we will all be back in this building, loving God together, praising God together, doing all sorts of great worship. I can't wait to see how much you guys have really taken on memorizing the New City Catechism. Um, it, it's been fun teaching this. You know, it's, a, it's something different, and hopefully it's, it's been fun for you guys while you've been at home more often, that you've had something to do for those who are memorizing the catechisms. Either way, uh, we got another great service put together for you. We tried to do something a little different this week to change it up. And, um, well, Miss Priscilla will be leading you guys through the book of John as we continue in the preschool series on John Tells All About Jesus. And Miss Megan has new songs for you that, um, you know, we're going to do them for about a month. And... There's a good chance that you guys will be here singing those songs with Miss Megan before we change out the songs again. And then just a special treat uh, for the first time since we started doing this, this at-home church on video, we're going to have a different teacher for New City Catechism. So, you know, I've loved teaching you guys, but we are so blessed by God in this church to have so many wise and gifted Bible teachers. And uh, it'd be hogging if I got to have all the fun teaching you guys from New City Catechism. So this week, we will have Mr. Rob come and teach you guys New City Catechism. So I'm excited to see what Mr. Rob has to say. I'm excited for new songs. But first, preschool kids, are you ready for Miss Priscilla to teach you from the book of John? All right, let me pray for you since I'm not going to see you guys at the end of this. It's going to go to those other teachers. Um, so let me pray for you guys, and I hope that you enjoy worshiping God with all these gifted leaders we have here at Cornerstone. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for gifting me as a pastor, for gifting these children with great leaders, adults who love you and love your word I pray, God, that they would effectively lead these children into worship of you. Thank you, God, for giving us summertime in Alaska. Thank you, God, that it seems as though you've spared much of our state from the hardship that other places are dealing with from the coronavirus. You've answered prayer and you've protected us. And thank you, God, that it seems as though things are starting to open up again. And as things open up and as people are starting to move around more and they're starting to go more places. Thank you, God, for bringing people back to Cornerstone Church. Help us to love you and to love others. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kiddos, let's go to Miss Priscilla. Hi, kids. So good to see you again. Is the time coming soon when we might see each other? I hope so. We're just really looking forward to that time, aren't we? We miss you, I miss you, I miss your faces, I miss your hugs, I miss watching you play and watching you do puzzles in our room. <clears throat> I miss seeing your moms and dads and I'm just gonna be so glad when we can all be together again. <clears throat> Let's have our Bible story for today, okay? First, let's, let's do the B-I-B-L-E. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E Bible. Why do we stand alone on the Word of God? Do you know why? Because it is His words for us, and we know that His words are truth, and so we can believe them. When we read the Bible, when we see what God has to say to us in His Word, the Bible, we can believe and we can listen to it and we can say, 
I want to follow that. I want to obey what God's Word says because His Word is truth. So what's our Bible story for today? Remember, we're in the book of John again. The book of John was written by one of Jesus' disciples. His name was John. And he wrote to tell us all about his experiences with Jesus, the things that he heard Jesus say, the things that he saw Jesus do, the things that he was able to talk with Jesus about, and he saw Jesus do so many things. We saw him in our stories. We have, we have talked about where Jesus turned water into wine. We have talked about um, when Jesus was with the woman from Samaria. Do you remember that story? That was our story last week. And the woman from Samaria came to Jesus at the well. Do you remember? And she and Jesus had some good talking back and forth. And she had some good questions. And Jesus answered her. Jesus told her about all the things that she had done that she wasn't very happy with. But Jesus told her that he was the Messiah. And she got so excited. She thought, this is finally the Messiah that's here. And she went running to the town where she lived. And she told everybody that she knew about Jesus, that he was the Messiah. And those people came out to Jesus where he was by the well. And they said, would you come and stay with us for two days and talk to us and teach us more? And so Jesus and his disciples went to this, this town where the Samaritan woman lived. And he talked to them and he taught them. And so many people believed on Jesus during that time. And at the end of that time, they said, this man is the Savior of the world. So that's one of the names that we know Jesus by, isn't it? Well, today our story is, happens shortly after his time in Samaria because he left Samaria and he went on up to Galilee. And in, in Galilee, it was a big area, but in Galilee was the town of Cana. Remember, that's where he turned the water into wine. And while he was there with his disciples, a man came to him. Now, this man must have heard about Jesus. He must have heard that Jesus had turned water to wine in Cana. He must have heard that Jesus had been healing some people. Because this man, now he was a very important person in the government. And he could have gone to lots of doctors. And maybe he had gone to lots of doctors because his son was very, very sick. And his son wasn't getting better. His son was still so sick he had a bad fever. And the dad was afraid that his son was going to die. So he came to Jesus. He heard that Jesus was close by, and he walked and walked until he got to Jesus. Now, it was a ways away. It, was, it took him several hours to get to Jesus. But when he got there, he found Jesus, and he went to him, and he, he said, Jesus, could you please come to my house and heal my son? And Jesus looked at him, and I think Jesus saw something in this man. I think Jesus saw that this man believed that Jesus was not just an ordinary person. I think he believed that Jesus must be God. Maybe he was God. He knew that he did marvelous things. And so he asked Jesus if Jesus would heal his son. Jesus said to him, he said, you may go home now. Your son will be healed. Your son is healed. And the man could have said, but Jesus, I ask you to come to my home. You, sh you need to do that, okay? Because you need to be there with him. He could have said that. He could have said, um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you should do something fancy and, and make some motions with your hands or do something. But he didn't do that either. When he heard Jesus say, you may go home, your son is healed, he took 
Jesus at his word. That's what it says in, in the Bible. He took Jesus at his word. That means that he believed just what Jesus said. And he turned around and he started to go home. Now, it took him several hours to get home. And in fact, it was the next day before he got close to where he lived. And when he was getting close to the town where he lived, one of his servants came running to him and said, Sir, guess what? Your son is well. The fever left him and he's well now. And the man said, Okay, now what time was it when he got well? And the servant said, Yesterday at about the seventh hour, his fever left him and he was well. And you know what? The man realized that that was the exact time that Jesus had said, you may go home, your son is healed. He realized that Jesus, what Jesus had said, had actually happened at exactly the same time. So he went on home, and I bet you he gave his son a big hug, didn't he? He was so thankful for his son to be healed. But then he started telling his family about it and all of the servants. And he said, guess, who, guess what? Guess who I saw? And guess what he said? He is the one who healed my son. And his whole family and all of his servants believed in Jesus. They knew that he wasn't just an ordinary person. They knew that he was God. I think they knew that he was God. He, he couldn't have, a, an ordinary person couldn't have done what Jesus did. But Jesus did. Jesus loves us so much, you know. And Jesus loves to take care of us. Jesus loves to, to see that we are happy and well. That's not the way it is all the time, though, is it? Sometimes we get sick, just like this the man's son in our Bible. Sometimes things happen that aren't fun, and we pray about them, don't we? We can always pray to God. We can always go to God and say, Lord God, would you please heal my body? Lord God, would you please make my grandma well? Lord God, would you please keep this storm from causing damage? And sometimes, we see those answers right away, just like this man saw the answer right away from Jesus. But sometimes we don't see the answer right away. Sometimes we, it's, it feels like maybe God didn't hear us. And so we can start doubting and we can say, God, did you hear me? I think you need to listen better, God. I think you need to answer me right away. And we can doubt or we can argue with God. But you know what God just loves? God just loves us, loves it when we pray to him about something and then we believe that God is going to do just exactly what is the very best thing. It doesn't always happen the way we want it to or the way we think it's going to happen. But we know that because God loves us so much, that God will do just exactly the best thing for us. And we need to just believe and trust him that he is going to do what's best for us because he loves us so much. Okay, kids, let's sing a couple of songs, okay? Let's sing our two songs that we sing so often, almost every time, huh? Every week we sing Jesus Loves Me, and then we sing Have I Not Commanded You? Those are two special songs because we, we need to remember all the time how much Jesus loves us. And because he loved us so much, he came down to this earth to grow up to be our savior, to be the savior of the world, and to take the punishment for our sins. And then our other song, Have I Not Commanded You? That reminds us that Jesus is with us all the time. So we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be discouraged. We don't need to wonder if he's with us. He has promised that he will be with us all the time. So let's sing our songs, okay, ready? 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Okay, let's sing, Have I Not Commanded You? Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go, wherever you go. Let's sing it again. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go, wherever you go. And we find it in the Bible, don't we? Just like we do every time we say, Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray together, okay? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a God that always does what you say you're going to do. And you have said in your word, the Bible, that you will be with us always. And so we are just so thankful for that. Thank you that when we pray to you, you hear us. You care about us, and you will answer us in the best way for us. Help us to trust you more and more and more each day. Trust you that you will do what's best, that your love for us will never go away, and that you will always be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, we'll see you next week, okay? Bye-bye. song is going to be I am free whenever summer approaches it feels like we are given so much freedom right freedom from schoolwork freedom from a lot of our routines but even more important than all of those things is the freedom that Jesus brings to our hearts he brings us freedom from sin right freedom from living in old sinful ways and he gives us new life so let's sing it together
job, everybody. Let's remember this week to use words of life and encouragement to those around us. Some days life feels perfect, other days it just ain't working. The good, the bad, the right, the wrong, and everything in between. Yo, it's crazy, amazing. We can turn our heart through the words we say. Mountains crumble with every syllable. Hope can live or die. So speak life, speak life. To the deadest, darkest night. Speak life, speak life. When the sun won't shine and you don't know why. Look into the eyes of the broken hearted. Watch them come alive as soon as you speak hope. You speak love. Just fall apart I do, I don't, I will, I won't It's like I'm drowning in the deep Well it's crazy To imagine words from our lips As the arms of compassion Mountains crumble with every syllable Hope can live or die There's no motions. We're just going to spend a few minutes thinking about the gifts that God has given us and that we are his children. We're going to sing that out this morning, that I am a child of God. We are his. Who am I that the highest king would well? lost but he brought me and oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh is free Ransom me, his grace runs deep. 
praise you this morning. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to take all of the punishment for all that we've done wrong so that our hearts could be set free. Thank you for that. Thank you for cleansing our hearts, God. We praise you for who you are. You alone are the one true God and you alone can bring salvation. God, I pray this morning that you would continue to strengthen my friends, and God, that as we hear your words of truth, that they would bring power to us in our lives to change who we are, God, to bring you glory, and to share that love with those around us. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Hey guys, my name is Mr. Rob, and a lot of you guys know me from second and third grade class, and sometimes I've taught your fourth and fifth grade and even large group. So hopefully some of you guys recognize me. I know I can't see you guys right now, but I'm really excited that I get a chance to be back in church today. It's been a long time. Uh, really looking forward to being in church this weekend, and uh, looking forward to seeing some of you guys too, if you guys make it this weekend. For, uh, before we get started with our New City Catechism, we're going to talk about one announcement. And that is the Awana Drive Up Award Delivery. Now, for those of you that had your name announced in the Awana Award Ceremony, this is for you. So this Tuesday, everybody say at home, this Tuesday, make sure you tell your parents, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., you have an opportunity to drive to the church and to actually pick up your award from some of your leaders. So you get a chance to see some of your leaders here to give you your award. Now, if you can't make it on Tuesday, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., then we can bring that gift to you. Now, please let Pastor Catlin know as soon as you can if you'll be able to make it this Tuesday from 6.30 to 8. If not, we'll make sure that we get in contact with you and we deliver that gift as soon as we can. All right, I think that's all of our announcements. And without any further ado, we're gonna jump right into the New City Catechism, question number eight. Before we do so, why do we study the New City Catechism? I think I heard some of you guys answer that question. Because what we think about God affects what you think about everything else. So Pastor Catlin talked about that last week in terms of how we think about God affects the rest of our life. Today we're going to talk about what we think and what we know about what God requires and what God commands of us. Now, we talked last week about why that's important because how can we know what we're supposed to do unless we've been told what we're supposed to do? How can we know the rules unless we've been told the rules? So we talked last week on question seven, and let's review question seven real quick. So question seven is asked, what does the law of God require? The answer to question seven is that we love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And we talked about that coming from Matthew. This is Jesus explaining to us the law. And he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he answered with that first answer, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. So everything you have is devoted to loving God. And he says the second one is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. So we understand that the law of God requires us to love God and to love people. Now, loving God and loving people is, is very simple and, and somewhat easy to understand, but God goes even further than that. And in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, he actually explains to us exactly what that entails. So before we go any further, let's make sure we pull out our Bibles. Go ahead and pick them up. I have mine here. Hopefully you guys have yours back at home. And we're going to take a minute. Now, obviously, before we can open the Bible, what do we have to do? We have to herald the Word of God, okay? So I'm going to say I'm holding thee, and you guys are going to say Word of God. Are you ready? Okay. I am holding thee. Wow, actually, I think I heard you guys from all the way over here. Well done, well done. Okay, well, you're still louder than I am, so... Great job, guys. Okay, so without any further ado, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. If you guys aren't sure where that is, that's on the far left side in the Old Testament. 
It's the second book of the Bible. We've been talking about Exodus for quite a while, so hopefully you guys already have that picked out. All right, Exodus 20 and verse 3. And I'm going to read the text for you this morning. It says, You shall have no other gods before me. Now, this is the first commandment. I'm not going to read for you the entirety of Exodus 20 all the way down to uh, 17 because we don't want to go through the entirety of that right now. But Exodus 20 and verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me, sets the foundation for every commandment that we're going to talk about in these next 10 commandments. So what are the 10 commandments? I think most of you guys know that. And to answer that question, we're going to go into question 8 for New City Catechism, which is, as you guys can see right here, what is the law of God stated in the Ten Commandments? And the answer to that question is, as you guys can also see right here, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And you shall not covet. Whew. Ten. Hmm. Ten commandments that you guys can see right there. Those ten commandments are what God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Those ten commandments are what the children of Israel used to live their life in all of the Old Testament. And those Ten Commandments are what Jesus summarized, what he summed up in Matthew, where he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So before we go into the actual commandments themselves, I want to ask, why did we start last week with the New Testament, and why are we going to the Old Testament this week? Sometimes it can be confusing because we would think we would start with the Ten Commandments now and then we would go into what Jesus said about the Ten Commandments. The reason that we're going to talk about the Old Testament second this week is because it still matters. A lot of people like to think sometimes that the Old Testament is something that we don't have to pay attention to anymore, that, that under the New Covenant, obviously, we only have to focus on the New Testament. But that's not what Jesus is saying. No, what Jesus is saying uh, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40, is that ultimately, those two commandments that Jesus gives, it summarizes all of the Ten Commandments. And we still have to keep those Ten Commandments. We're still expected to follow those Ten Commandments because they are still good, and they still show us how to live righteously as God wants us to live. So as we go through these Ten Commandments, let's not ignore them and pretend like they don't matter anymore. But let's instead, let's use those and say, this is what God has given to us to show us how to live properly. So we're going to go through these. And the way that we're going to break them down is kind of on a uh, one uh, tablet versus the second tablet way of thinking. So I want you guys to think about it this way. The first four commandments relate to how we are supposed to relate to God. The second six commandments relate to how we relate to man. So when we're thinking about this, we're going to break it down to the first four and then the next six. And that way we get all ten. But those first four, remember, relate to how we think about God. So as we jump into this, let's make sure that we remember that these commandments relate to all the law. So number one, the Bible says, You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 23. We just talked about that. Why is that important to have no other gods before God? And the answer is quite simple, because there's only one God. See, a lot of times we talk about gods, we use lowercase g, because we're talking about uh, inferior gods, or, or people that, uh, or people think oftentimes that there are gods in some capacities, but there's only one God. And the big word I'm going to teach you today for that is the word monotheism. And that word really just means mono, one, and theism, God. And so we say Christianity is a monotheistic religion. The reason that we believe there's only one God, it's quite simple. It's because if there were more than one God, they wouldn't be God. Because the definition of God is someone who is all-present, all-powerful, all-knowing. And if you can't be all-present, all-powerful, and all-knowing because you're sharing that power with someone else, 
then you're not God. So remember that, guys, that there is no other God before God because there's only one God. Very important to remember, and that lays the foundation for these first four and even these Ten Commandments. Now, the second commandment teaches us something that says, you shall not make for yourself an idol. See, this sounds kind of like we're saying the same thing, right? We, we know there's only one God, and we know that we're not supposed to make idols now. But I, I thought, you know, there's only one God, so why would we even have a problem with making an idol? And here's what God is saying when he says, you shall not make for yourself an idol. A lot of times we try to imagine God in some capacity. We, we try to create images of God that we think uh, will honor him maybe, or we think will perhaps be what he's like. But that's not our job. You see, God has revealed himself to us. God has shown who he is to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And in that revelation, that is the perfect embodiment of God because Jesus was God. So for us to try to take, for example, like the children of Israel did with Aaron, this golden calf, and to build this, this large, large creature's animal to uh, honor and to represent God is in fact idolatry. And they did that at the bottom of the mountain while Moses was at the top of the mountain receiving the law of God. And while he was doing that, Aaron took the people and created this giant golden calf and said, this is your God. This is who got you out of the land of Egypt and has brought you here. But in fact, that's not what God looks like. That is not what God has revealed himself to be because the perfect revelation of God is again in Jesus Christ. So let's remember that number two talks about how we create images or how we understand God to be. Number three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Now, this one is one that I'm really, really passionate about. I'm passionate about all 10, but this one is, is very near and dear to me. I doubt most of you guys who are watching this have a hard time with this yet, but just take my word for it. The older you get, the more that you might hear people misuse the name of the Lord your God. And what that may mean is that you may be tempted to do the same thing. So let's think about how the children of Israel thought about God. They had a name for God, the name for God, that was so holy, that was so sacred and so set apart, they wouldn't even say it. They wouldn't even write it fully out. Let's think about the fact that they took God's name so seriously, they wouldn't write or say it. But today, oftentimes, we hear people say the name of God or say the name of Jesus in a way that doesn't glorify and doesn't honor God. Now, praise God that we have a relationship if we are chosen by God and we are redeemed, that we can know him as our Father and we can pray to him and we can pray to the Father through Jesus. So we can use those names to glorify God. But how can we justify taking the name of God and using it in a way that doesn't glorify him. It, it's just something that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Uh, it's something that unfortunately we do see a lot of in places and other parts of the world and other parts outside of the church. So I encourage you guys, while it may not be something that you take, uh, it may not affect you too much now, it's something that the older you get, the more you're gonna see. And I want you to always take the name of God seriously and to always use it in a way that glorifies him above all else. And the last one that relates to God we're going to talk about says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So the word Sabbath, what does that word even mean? It's kind of a weird word, right? Well, it's actually from the Hebrew. And the Hebrew, remember, is what the Old Testament was written in. And that word Sabbath means Shabbat. And the word Shabbat literally means to cease or to stop. So let's read that again. Remember the day of ceasing by keeping it holy. So what is God saying when he's saying, remember this special day of ceasing? What, what, what are we ceasing? What are we stopping? And the answer is work. See, that's the day that for uh, the Old Testament on Saturday, they ceased working. There was no more uh, working in the fields. There was no more having to go to work altogether. Instead, it was a day focused solely on God and on resting your soul, resting your body, and resting your mind in the Lord. 
Now today, the first day of the week is our Sabbath, so we have Sunday. And that's why you guys come to church on Sunday, or most often we come to church on Sunday. So the same concept applies. That is the day that we are to cease from work, which doesn't mean we don't have to go anywhere because obviously we still come to church and obviously we still worship God and obviously Pastor Catlin or Pastor Brad, they're still here preaching the word of God. It doesn't mean we cease from doing anything altogether. What it means is that we focus solely on God so that we can rest in him. And ultimately that pushes us or it focuses us on something that's going to happen in the future. And that is when we have perfect rest in Jesus. That is when we have perfect fulfillment of everything that we've read in the Bible. And we now know that we don't have to wake up and go to work anymore. We don't have to struggle through living in this life. We don't have to fight against the sin that we have to combat. We're going to talk about sin in the next coming weeks. But instead, we have the opportunity to simply rest in God forever. What an amazing thing the Sabbath day points us towards. We're going to go a little bit faster through these next six, but remember, those first four there are the first four that relate to our relationship with God. Now, these next six relate to our relationship with man. Number five says, honor your father and your mother. So honoring our father and mother seems pretty simple, and honestly, it is pretty simple. What we're going to talk about, though, is why we would do that. Why does God mention specifically honoring our mother and our father? And the answer to that is that God has established the family. That family is the unit that he uses to teach us and to grow us. And for you kids watching at home, your mom, your dad have the opportunity to help you grow in the Lord. And that's what God has established the family for, to allow us to not simply have to grow up uh, on our own or to have to grow up and, and try to figure things out, but instead we have the opportunity to have the family, that mother and that father, that can actually teach us the word of God, nurture us, and help us to grow in him. So remember, honor your mother and your father. Obey your mother and your father because God has commanded you to do so. Number seven teaches us, you shall not murder. Now, murder is something that we all probably understand is bad, to kill someone uh, who we have no right to kill. So an actual translation in the King James Version says, you shall not kill. That's how it translates that same commandment. Now, why does the Bible say you shall not kill, you shall not murder? Is there a difference? And the answer is, yes, there is a difference. Because we have life, and that life is given to us by God. God ultimately controls and commands life. And God at times has commanded when life would be removed, when people will die. And he has at times, and we can read it in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Joshua, where the children of Israel conquered other people. And to do so, they did kill. Now, that was not sin for them because God ordained that. However, for us, if we kill someone or if someone dies and God did not ordain it, then we are breaking one of the commandments. Okay, number seven. It says, you shall not commit adultery. Hmm. So the way that we're going to talk about this, adultery is something that happens when two people in the most intimate relationship that humans can know, which is a husband and a wife, when one of them steps outside of marriage and chooses somebody else. I'm married, so everybody can see this ring on my finger right here. I'm married to Miss Rachel, and some of you guys might know her, hopefully you do. Beautiful, awesome woman, and I'm so blessed that God has given her to me to be my wife for the rest of our lives. If she ever chose somebody else instead of me, now that we're married, that would break my heart. So why does God tell us this? Obviously, it matters to us. Obviously, it means something to us but it also represents something else. Because when we choose to sin, when we choose to break one of these commandments, to go outside of the 10 commandments that God has given to us, we're breaking God's heart. The same way as if she chose somebody else, we're choosing something else. We're saying, God, I see you, I know your commandments for me, but instead, I'm gonna choose this sin. I'm gonna choose this other thing that you don't want me to do. And in the same way that that breaks my heart, it would break God's heart. 
So let's remember that God has given us these intimate relationships and they are a representation of our relationship between us and God. Number eight, the Bible says, you shall not steal. Very simple. I think we can all understand that taking things that don't belong to us, and hopefully you guys all know that's wrong, is in fact a sin and is breaking a commandment that God has given to us. Number nine says, you shall not give false testimony. That means you shall not lie. You shall not, if you are brought, um, if, if something happens at home, let's say, and your parents ask you, hmm, did you see your brother or did you see your sister do this thing? And you didn't really see it. You have no idea what happened, but you lie and you say, yes, I saw them take that cookie or yes, I saw them break that vase. You're giving a false testimony. You are lying against your brother or your sister, which is something that the Bible also commands us not to do. And number 10 says, you shall not covet. Coveting is when we desire something, we want something that somebody else has. It's not ours, but instead we say, I want that new toy. I want that new, for some of you older kids, car. I'm, probably most of you aren't driving, but for me, you know, that might be something I struggle with. I want that new house. I want blah, 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 blah. Fill in the blank for whatever you want that somebody else has, but that is coveting. We are wanting what they have instead of appreciating what God has given to us. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So these are the 10 commandments. We've gone through all 10 of them now, the first four relating to God and the last six relating to man and how we're supposed to actually relate. So the final question I'm gonna ask you guys is why does this matter? We've seen through these 10 that even though there's only 10 of them, it's still kind of a lot. I mean, we covered a lot of ground here. We, we went from all the way from having one God to not coveting and everything in between. And sometimes it can be kind of hard to remember them. Sometimes it can be kind of difficult. Is it important that we keep all of them? I mean, if, what if I kept only nine? Let's say I was almost perfect and I only did one wrong thing. I only broke one commandment. Do you think God would be okay with that? I mean, it's only one out of 10. No, because God demands and he expects perfection. He says that in order for you to be with me, you have to be righteous and you have to be holy as I am holy. Which means God keeps all 10 of these commandments perfectly. So a tie-in to our next week's question is, uh, can we ever keep the law of God perfectly? Can we ever live perfectly? And uh, we're gonna talk more about that next week, so I won't give away the answer right now. But just remember that breaking even one commandment is something that goes against God. And it is something that is ultimately going to put you in danger of death. So let's not take lightly any of these commandments and let's make sure that we keep them to the best of our abilities. Pray with me. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to even from home get a chance to understand, to learn from, to read, and to hear your word. God, we thank you that we don't have to sit here and to be isolated, but instead we can be part of the body of Christ, part of the church. And I thank you, Lord, for this word that you've given to us, for these 10 commandments that you have placed in our lives. You've given us this word that we can now read in our own language, and we have the opportunity even to understand it. And God, I thank you that you have made clear to us what it is that you expect and that you command of us. And Father, I pray that insofar as it is to our ability and through the Holy Spirit's leading that you would give us the ability to keep these commandments, that you would let us live our lives, that we would honor you and that we would honor our neighbors, that we would love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength, and we would love our neighbor, we would love our friends, and we would love our family as we love ourselves. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to recognize your word. And I pray now that as we have an opportunity to finish this prayer, we would actually live that word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Great work, brother. That was awesome with the adults.